Glory to God. Well, open your Bibles if you would. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Has the Lord been good to you? Yes. Glory to God. Open your Bibles if you would to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We've been looking at the subject of the wiles of the enemy versus faith in God. And we're finding out that we have an enemy. You have an enemy. If you're born again, child of God, you have an enemy. But how many of you know this? God doesn't just address the issue. He tells us how to overcome, to be overcomers. And God wants his kids to have victory. After all, it's hard to have a testimony if you're losing. What is a testimony? A testimony is about the goodness of God, the greatness of God, and how we're winning. Everybody say, we win. Look at your neighbor and go, I win. Now notice here in 1 Peter chapter 5, let's go to verse 8 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and verse 9. The Holy Ghost through Peter, writing to believers, writing to you and I. The epistles are written to believers, the benefits for you and I, what Christ has done. He said in verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, who's our adversary? The devil is, glory to God. Hallelujah. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And, of course, notice it doesn't say he's going around just seeking anybody. He has to hunt for somebody. He has to look for somebody. Look to your neighbor and go, I am not a lamb chop for the enemy. Look to somebody and say, as a matter of fact, I always have the armor of God on me. And it goes on to tell us, now that we know that we have an enemy going about devouring, trying to devour people, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and what church? And to destroy. You just need to know that you have opposition. But how many know this? God is greater than your opposition. Everybody say amen. Now notice in verse 9, here's how we're going to stop him from devouring us. And it goes on to tell us, whom resist steadfast in the faith. So what is he telling us? Well, the enemy's going about looking to find out. He's checking people over who he can devour. And notice God tells us to resist the enemy. Everybody say, resist the devil. Can you resist the devil? Apparently you can. How many know that? You're not doing it in yourself. You're doing it under the authority of God in the name of Jesus. And it goes on to tell us, whom resists steadfast, everybody say, in the faith. Come on, everybody say, in the faith. Because we're talking about gaining victory. God wants us to be in faith, not fear. And the enemy loves to bring fear. Fear, the Bible does talk about the fear of God, but that type of fear is a reverence or a respect. This fear is a tormenting fear that Paul wrote uh, to, to Timothy, talking about the spirit of fear. God has not given us the spirit of fear because fear, everybody say fear, torments us. God wants us to be in peace. So the enemy will bring fear. And he said, whom resists steadfast in the faith, Knowing that, we need to know this and remind ourselves of this, knowing that the same afflictions, the word afflictions is not meaning sickness and disease, it just means a test or trials, that the enemy's coming at you and I, <clears throat> he said, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And then let's go to 1 John chapter 5, a little bit further back, 1 John chapter 5. Once again, we're in the epistles written to the believers. So we know that we need to get in faith. You and I need to get in faith. We looked in the Scriptures. The Bible tells us that God wants us to walk by faith, not by sight, and we're to live. Everybody say, I'm to live by faith. Remember, the enemy's out there, and we don't know everything. God knows everything, and we need to learn to listen to the Holy Ghost to stay prepared, stay ready. We found out months ago, Jesus, he had the enemy come at him, so if Jesus had the enemy come at him, Matthew chapter 4 talks about Jesus had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. The Bible says at the end of that, why did he come at the end of that? Well, because that's when you're going to be the most hungry. Haven't eaten for 40 days. Haven't, you know, you've been just fellowshipping with God in the Word, praying. Jesus is, is hearing the Father's voice, and the enemy comes, 
And what does he do? He gives him three temptations. Everybody say three temptations. And so how did Jesus defeat the enemy? How did he overcome the temptation? Because remember, Jesus never missed it. He always passed the test. What did he do? He always came back. The enemy would say something to him, ask him to do something, or tempt him to do something, and Jesus would always come back with the Word of God. How are we going to overcome the enemy when he wants us, tempts us to do something where we shouldn't be doing or where we haven't been authorized to do? We need to know the Word of God. Everybody say, know the Word of God. Now listen, it's not just knowing the Word of God, but you have to use the Word. You have to speak the Word. Everybody say, I must do like Jesus did and speak the Word. And if you go back in Matthew chapter 4, you'll find out three temptations came to Jesus and three different times. He quoted Old Testament scriptures. Pastor, why did he quote Old Testament scriptures? Well, because we didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts all the way to Revelation yet. Why? It wasn't written. So Jesus used the Old Testament. How many know the Word of God is powerful from Genesis to Revelation? But listen, it's only powerful to those that know it. If you don't know it, then you can't use it as your weapon to the enemy. That's why the enemy loves it when people don't read their Bibles. The enemy loves it when they don't go to church. Why? He's keeping you ignorant. But how many of you know this? It's by your own choice. It's not because you didn't have the choice. So aren't you glad you came tonight? 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 tells us, And whatsoever is born of God, notice again talking about being born of God means born again. When you and I accept Christ into our lives, we're born of the Spirit of God. That's the plan of God. God designed it. That's why He sent His Son. And it said in verse 4, And whatsoever, some translations say whosoever, is born of God. Notice this. Do we have any Christians in here tonight? That means you've been born again by the Spirit of God. Notice what God is telling you and I. He said, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh what church? The world. How many know that's present tense? That means right now you're in this world, but God has a plan that you can overcome everything that's in this world. And he goes on to tell us, how do I gain that? Once again, God doesn't only put the carrot out there, but he shows you how to get the reward. God doesn't just say it's out there for you, but he says how to get it. Everybody say how to get it. So what's the goal for every believer that every believer should get a hold of? I'm an overcomer. Everybody say I'm an overcomer. How many of you are born again? Raise your hand. If you're born again, then you're in Christ and Christ is in you. The Spirit of God is in you. As far as God's concerned, His plan and purpose is everything He wants you to do is going to cause you to overcome the world. Everybody say, overcome the world. Are you going to have obstacles? Absolutely. If, you're, if you think you're not going to have obstacles, then you won't have anything to overcome. Why? The world is contrary to the Word of God. They're going in darkness. God's Word and His kingdom and the church are going in the light. One's going up, one's going down. How many of you like going up? I like getting promoted, don't you? So it begins to tell us, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Everybody say, I am an overcomer of this world. Stand up and tell two people real quickly, I am an overcomer of this world. Go ahead and testify and tell somebody, I am. Notice we're not trying to be, we're not trying to earn it. You can't earn it. This is what God delegated to you being his kids. He said, overcometh the world, and this is the victory. Or in other words, this is how you're going to get the victory. Anybody want the victory? Uh, years gone by, I'm an athlete. Now I'm not an athlete anymore. Glory to God. My idea of an athlete is maybe running here and there a little bit, but not like I used to. In those days, I played, and whatever sporting event I was involved in, I did it to win. Anybody else with me? Uh, there were, I remember a couple of times, you know, we were in big tournaments and stuff, and we got second place. What did you do? Well, in Little League, I cried. I got mad. I got upset. Well, Pastor, what's so bad about second place? First place loser. Now, listen, we need to get a mindset in the church. We got to get a mindset because God has a mindset for you and I. 
We need to stop accepting things that God is not accepting. And He wants us to start getting a mentality about being a winner, about being the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. And if it's not going to be that way, bless God, then we need to get ourselves out there and get aggressive about the things of God. Everybody say amen. This, this idea of being real passive and, well, just whatever, the enemy loves that. To me, that's like an under Revelation chapter 3. That's like an unto the individual that's lukewarm. They love God. They believe in God. But they just don't want to get too hot for God. How many of you know we need to get on fire for the Lord? He gave his best, and we need to give our best. So here's how you and I can get the victory of being that overcomer that God has in store for you and I. But it won't happen if you don't walk his plan out. Remember that. It does not happen automatically, despite what a lot of people tell you. He said, And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory. Everybody say, this is the victory. By the way, how many of you ever heard of a company called Nike? Look this word victory up. You're going to find it in the Hebrew dictionary. The word Hebrew, the word victory here means Nike or victory. God wants to give us victory. And he said, and this is the victory that overcometh the world. In other words, this is how you get the victory so you can overcome the world. Notice the last three words. Here is our answer. Verse 4. Everybody got it? 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says, everybody say, even or because of our faith. So how am I going to gain the victory? I'm going to use my faith. Everybody say, use my faith. Now the enemy loves it. And he's done it, and he's done it for years, mocking and making fun of faith preachers and faith teaching. Yet, when we do that, we're mocking and making fun of the avenue how God has told us to walk in and obtain and possess everything He wants to give to us. By faith. Everybody say, by faith. In other words, things just don't fall on you like ripe cherries. Now, God can do, and He will do some things for you and I, if you go back to Hebrews, go back to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 6 is this, God will just do things for individuals on a routine basis because they love God, they're pleasing Him, they're walking by faith, and He'll just do things for you. How many know parents are the same way? Your kids are obeying, your kids are obedient. How many of you know? You want to just reward them, not because they ask for something, but because they're obeying you, they're obedient. How many know? And you want to do something for them. And this is the same way for you and I when we're walking by faith and using our faith. Notice Hebrews eleven six. 6. Everybody say, God is a rewarder. But now notice there's a stipulation to those who he rewards. He said, but without faith. So can you be without faith? Do you want to be without faith? Everybody say, no, I don't. Remember, if you're going to have victory, two avenues, either the world will overtake you or you'll overtake the world. You're going to have obstacles. You're going to have tests. You're going to have trials. But isn't it good to know when you have a test and a trial or tribulation or hard time, you have the Word of God. You can speak the Word, stand on the Word, and let the power of God move in that situation and override and overtake that situation for your favor. Or you can stand there, act like you're going to have the mentality of sucking it up, pull your boots up, and get overrun. The enemy, as it getting, he's very, very good at defeating people who won't use the word and be aggressive. Notice Hebrews 11. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. Him is God. So we could read it this way. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. So we know that there are other things that we could read that God is pleased in. But we also know this, that if I want to be pleasing to God, then I have to be a faith person. By the way, if you're a child of God, the day you got saved, God jump-started everybody in this room. The Bible tells us that he gave every one of us the measure of faith. So 
Don't ever let anybody tell you or the devil put the thought in your mind, you don't have any faith. Everybody say, I have at least the measure of faith. Now, how many know we need to do something with that measure then? We need to increase it. We need to add to it and keep putting in it. So it is possible, but if I don't, if I don't have my faith, then I'm not going to be pleasing to God. For notice, for he that cometh to God must believe. Everybody say, must believe. There's that word faith, talking about believing in faith. So when you come to God, you must believe that he is. How many of you believe that God is God? How many believe he exists? And how many of you have to believe that? That's part of the faith. Notice what else. He said, and this is something else that we're to believe. And that he, God, is a rewarder. Everybody say, God is a rewarder. Look at your neighbor and say, God is a rewarder. Point to yourself and say, God is a rewarder. Now notice he's very specific. How many of you want to be rewarded from God? Is he promising that he would reward? Yes. But notice, here's the condition. And he that is a rewarder, of them that diligently, everybody say diligently, that diligently, what church? Seek him. So who are the people that get rewarded from God? Those, everybody say those, that diligently seek God. So what does that mean for the part-timers? Probably not going to get the way you want to. Hello, church. I know this is a revelation for some people, but we got to get this in our hearts. I just don't understand, God, why aren't you doing anything? And he might be going, I'm waiting on you. Everybody say, he's waiting on us. Actually, the Bible tells us that God's already ceased from his work. Now he's just watching through the person of the Holy Spirit over his word. He's watching for somebody that will grab a hold of the word of God and say, Father, I see in your word. It says this, I believe it. I receive it, and thank you, Father God, I'm going to do it. Everybody say, doers of the word. And so how do I get that faith? How do I get that victory to overcome the world? I'm going to have to use my faith. Everybody say, use my faith. Now, let's go back, if you would, to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I mean, I get amazed at people. They, oh, you're one of them faith preachers. Yep, I'm a faith preacher, and I'm a faith teacher. As a matter of fact, you can't get saved without faith. So if you don't like faith, you're going to have a hard time getting saved. You're going to have a hard time praying the prayer of faith. You're going to have a hard time receiving anything from God because God and His Word are going to a lot of times be in opposition to what you're seeing and facing. Notice here in James chapter 1. Everybody say James chapter 1. Notice in verse 1, James 1 verse 1, it says, James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Verse 2, my brother, it's a term of endearment here, talking about brothers and sisters in the Lord. Notice he said, count it all joy. Everybody say, count it all joy. <coughs> now, you have to understand what he's talking about here. The Holy Ghost is talking to him because read verse 1, you'll find out the twelve tribes are referring to Israel. Persecution went in Israel, was happening in Israel, and so what did they do? They scattered abroad. Now they're in foreign grounds. They're in outside of their towns and where their homes are at. They're living in different places. Everybody say different places. They're not living in their homes. They're scattered abroad because of persecution. And to be honest with you, Jesus told them that they really weren't supposed to just stay in Jerusalem. He told them that they were supposed to go into the highways in the cities and the byways and what? Spread the gospel. Everybody say, spread the gospel. So how many of you know, because the church didn't go out and the early church didn't go out, they just stayed there. What happened? Listen, when you disobey God, protection goes down. Persecution can come in. Come on, church. Sometimes persecution will come because you're going to make a stand on the word. Sometimes persecution is allowed by God because you're disobeying God and he has to let the protection come down. 
What happened? The enemy came in, drove them out of Jerusalem. The church of Jerusalem still existed, but what? The people needed to get out and spread the word. Now, you can understand, you just left your homeland. You're in another land. You're not living in your house that you're used to living in. Can you understand verse 2 when it said, count it all joy? Everybody say, count it all joy. What does that mean? Situations and circumstances that you're going to face in life, you're going to have to walk through, are not always going to be positive and good. But that doesn't mean you have to accept that as the final plan of God. But you can't let anything you and I face in this earth rob your joy. A lot of things going on in the world today trying to rob your joy. Just can't do it. You can't lose your joy over anything. Now notice here in James chapter 1, verse 2. My brother, and everybody say, my brother, count it all joy. Everybody say, all joy. He didn't say it was joy, but count it as joy. In other words, how would you be acting if it was joyful? Everybody say, i got to do this by faith. See, this is once again, God is initiating you and I to use our faith, believe what He says over the circumstance. He said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into. Everybody say, fall into. What does that mean? Find yourself in different temptations. I mean, you're just minding your own business, and bam, things are going to happen. Didn't mean you did anything wrong. The enemy's just doing a little spot check on you and I. Verse 3, knowing this. Everybody say, I need to know this. Knowing this, that the trying of your what? Faith. Everybody say, my faith is going to be tried. What does it do? It works patience or it works endurance. Why? God wants your faith to be able to last more than five seconds. God wants your faith to be able to stand in adversities for as long as it takes to get the answer to you completely. If your faith is only good for three minutes, then once your faith is done, now you're going to get back into fear. A lot of things you and I are asking God to do are not going to happen in just three minutes. It may take sometimes three years. If we're believing for people to come to the kingdom of God, how many know God wants people saved, but He's not making them saved? But He sure is a good persuader. Everybody say, He's a good persuader. He said in verse 4, But let patience or endurance... Have her perfect work that you may be perfect. Everybody say, or mature. God wants us to be mature Christians and entire wanting nothing. Now, that word wanting nothing doesn't mean that it's wrong for you to have things that you want. It just simply means you're able to get them. You're not always going around going, I need this, I need that. No, you're able to get them because you're able to stand on the Word of God. And if it takes too much to get here, then it takes too much to get here. But nevertheless, you're going to get it. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. So if I need wisdom in a situation, what did God just tell every one of us to do? Come on, what did he say to do, church? So if you need to know what to do in a situation, what am I to do? I'm supposed to ask the Father. What does this tell us? Let's read on. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not. The word abradeth means he's not going to hold it back and it shall be given him. Everybody say, it shall be given him. In other words, if you ask God for wisdom, he just gave you a promise, I will give it to you. Well, pastor, I did that, and I didn't get it. No, sorry, you're lying. Pastor, don't tell me that I know. I asked him, and I didn't get it. Sorry, I'm not going to call God a liar. God does not lie. The Bible says he cannot lie. Maybe you didn't hear it. Maybe you didn't wait long enough to listen to him. We're always wanting instant. 
We're in this instant pie society. We've got this microwave mentality. How many of you remember as a kid when you used to have before Jiffy Pop, before the microwave, you used to put the kernels in the pot with a little bit of oil and you had to shake it so you did. How many of you remember those days? Some of you, it does not fit. I'm not going to do that. Now we put it in a bag, three and a half minutes or whatever. We even have now on microwaves, most of them, a popcorn setting. Well, as times we had to work to get the popcorn. Everybody say work to get the popcorn. So here God said, if you ask him, because after all, he's the one that said, if you ask me, I'll give it to you. And he said, I won't hold it back. Everybody say, God won't hold it back. So I believe God always tells the truth. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men. Everybody say to all men. So does that mean you? Are you part of all men or all mankind? Absolutely. You just need to take time to listen to him. And abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Verse 6. Now he tells us when we ask wisdom, how am I supposed to ask him for wisdom? Notice, here's a key factor in asking him. But let him ask in what church? So when I ask the Father God for wisdom, I'm asking him because I believe, verse 5, that he'll give it to me. If you're just asking like a parrot and repeating it because the pastor said it, and, but you don't believe it, then listen, it won't come to pass. See, God tells us what to do, and then he tells us how to work it. Everything that I do, every time that I talk to the Father, every time, I may not have one kind of feeling or emotion or my hair might not stand up on my head or I might not have any goosebumps, but yet every time I'm talking to the Father and talking to Him about situations, I need to mix faith with that. Come on, church, because then that gives me access to the Father because God operates by faith. And He wants me as His kids to operate the way He operates, mixing faith. Why? 99.99999% of my prayers, if I was going by feelings, I had none. And if I'm going to come out of my prayer closet confident and assured that God heard me, then the only way that that's going to happen is when I go into the prayer closet, I believe God heard me. Hello, church. This is why people go through the motions, but they're not mixing faith with what they're doing. They're doing the right thing, but there's no faith being appropriated. He said, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Everybody say, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. In other words, one time you're in faith, two hours later you're in doubt. Then you're in faith, then you're in doubt. Then you're in faith, then you're in doubt. What are you? You're like, a wave goes up, you're in faith. The wave goes down, you're in doubt. A wave goes up, you're in faith. And the wind, what's the wind? The wind could be situations and things coming at you that it's tossing you and making you believe, not believe, believe, not believe, believe, not believe. That's frustrating for you and I. I'd rather stay in faith. Everybody say, stay in faith. Why? Because then I know I'm in a good position. He goes on to tell us, verse 7, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. In other words, if you're not asking in faith, you're not going to get anything from God. Not just wisdom, but nothing from God. Do we need the help of God? Do you and I need the help of God? Yes. So everything that I'm asking him, not just for wisdom, but everything I'm asking him, I need to make sure I am using my faith and receiving. Verse 9 or verse 8. A double-minded man. Everybody say double-minded man. Does it matter the thoughts you have? Huh? Does it matter how you think? Now notice, go back up here to verse 7. Underline this word right in the middle of verse 7. For let not that man, what church? Think. Everybody thinks think. What's thinking? Thinking's the mind. That's the soul. It matters how I think. I need to think the thoughts of God. I need to think in line of the Word of God. A double-minded man is 
unstable in how many of his ways? All of his ways. So it's so critical of my thinking. Now, go to Revelation. No, not Revelation. Go to Romans. Romans 14. Faith. By faith. In faith. Through faith. Glory to God. That's how we're going to get the victory. The enemy's out there. He's for real. But you don't need to get in fear. Just get in faith and stay in faith. Notice in Romans chapter 14, Romans chapter 14, verse 23, and we're going to really key in on this last part of faith. Is God loving it when you and I get into faith? Yes, absolutely. Does he want us to be faith people? Absolutely. God is a faith person, and he wants you and I to be a faith. Notice Romans 14, verse 23. If you got it, say, I got it. Romans 14, 23. Holy Ghost, through Paul, said to the church at Rome and to you and I, And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Talking about, you have to go back and talk about the food and things. We're looking at the very last part of verse 23. Because, notice, he eateth not in faith. So just taking a little tidbit here for just a moment. When we pray over our food, God talks over in, in 1 Thessalonians about praying over your food. Praying over your food, you give thanks. Everybody say, I give thanks. This is why we pray over food. We give thanks. We're not doing it to prove to people we're Christians. We're doing it because we're thankful. Everybody say, doing it because we're thankful. We're doing it, and the Scripture tells us about doing it with thanksgiving and because so that the word or, or so the food can be sanctified and fit to eat. I don't know about you, but I say this all the time because it's so pertinent. You go to a restaurant. Employees use restaurants. Employees should know to wash their hands before they go back preparing food. It always made me wonder because they put a sign on the mirror, not addressing the customer but addressing the food preparers, make sure you wash your hands. Well, we all like to think they do. But listen, I'm not going to get in fear if they don't because I'm going to give thanks for the food and I'm going to ask God to sanctify. The word sanctify means to separate to make it acceptable so that we can eat it so we don't get food poisoned, so we don't get sick. Everybody say amen. Now notice, so he's talking about when we eat, we should be eating in faith, thanking God and praising God that it, what we're eating is good. After we pray, we ought to believe what we pray. Now notice he goes on, but he expands it beyond just the food. He said, for whatsoever, everybody say whatsoever. That covers a lot of things, doesn't it? For whatsoever is not of faith. So in other words, whatever I'm doing in my life, he wants me to use my faith, the Word of God, so that I can walk by faith and live by faith in every area. And listen now, it's not to be judgmental, don't be critical of one another, because we're all learning and we're all growing. But here's God's view when we don't use our faith and we're doing things in this world. Notice what he said. For whatsoever is not of faith is what, church? Is sin. That's pretty harsh, isn't it? Why is God saying that? Because, listen, as long as you're walking in the physical realm, the sense realm, emotions and flesh and feelings, you are open game for the enemy. When you get behind the Word of God and start using the Word of God, using your faith, everybody say, using the Word of God, using my faith that God gave me, what am I doing now? Now I am under God's supernatural provision, and now I can expect His grace, which is His ability, to be on my life. And now, listen, now I'm walking and living by faith, not by fear. Now if somebody washes their hands, listen, whether they wash their hands or whether they don't wash their hands, I'm praying, I'm believing God that my food's blessed. And how many of you know, when that thought comes to your mind, oh, yeah, but what if they didn't? I just go, nope, 
God blessed it. God sanctified it. He said it's good to eat. As far as I'm concerned, God said it. I believe it. And that settles it. And I'm not going to entertain thoughts contrary to the Word. This is where people have the battle. The enemy brings thoughts. The enemy will bring pictures. The enemy will bring things to our memory. And he'll bring these things to us trying to contradict the Word. But we're choosing the Word. Everybody say, I'm choosing the Word. Glory to God. Now, go real quickly, real quickly to Romans chapter 4, just a couple of chapters back there. Oh, the enemy likes us to look at the wrong thing. Just give me two more minutes. I want you to notice something about looking. That's why we got to stay in the Word on a regular basis. Stay in the Word. Keep the Word in front of you all the time. Well, as a matter of fact, instead of going there, let's go back to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Let's just go all the way back to Proverbs chapter 4. The book of wisdom. Hallelujah. Proverbs chapter 4. God has keep the Word in front of our eyes. Man, these are days where the Word has got to be in front of our eyes on a regular basis. Why? So I don't get into fear. Rather, I can get into faith. So when I see other people in fear, that doesn't rub off on me. It doesn't move me. Rather, I can have the opportunity to help them get out of fear and get into faith. How many believe God wants us to enjoy the year 2020? Come on, how many believe He wants us to enjoy this year? A pastor, that's hard. No, listen, that's your thinking. God still has a silver lining for everybody. God still has a way of escape. But as long as you keep thinking that and keep saying that, then that's the kind of year you'll have. If you go back to Psalms, I believe Psalm 68, verse 15, where David said, God said through David, it'll be a good year. I believe it's going to be a good year. Hallelujah. Come on, church. See, you've got to either say what God says and give God the opportunity to make it a good year, or you'll say what you say, and then that's what you'll get. Well, I just knew it was a bad year. Well, that's what you've been confessing, so you shouldn't be surprised if it turns out that way. But the problem is you're working in the natural. We believe God is all-powerful, don't we, church? I believe God can take the worst situation around in our lives and turn it around for good. Anybody else believe that? But see, if you don't believe that, then God, you're not giving God the opportunity for it to happen. So notice Proverbs chapter 4, last verse of Scripture. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. Everybody say Proverbs 4, verse 20. Notice, he said, My son, attend to my words. Do the people of God need to get into the Bible? I got two, why, yep and yep. Do the people of God need to get into the Word of God? In other words, do you as a child of God need to open your Bible up and read it? Not just in church, but attend to it. Everybody say attend to it. Notice, God's telling us something once again. He's telling us what to do and what not to do. He said, my son, attend to my words. In Christ. So the first thing is, intend to the word. Number two, incline thine ears unto my saying. Everybody say, my ears must be allowed to hear the Word of God on a regular basis. Say it again, regular basis. See, he's not just talking about it every once in a while. He's talking about attending to the Word, attending to the Word, attending to the Word. Notice, he goes on to tell us. He said, to my saints, not to the world, not to what somebody else says, but to God's saints, verse 21, let them not depart from what? Thine eyes. So do I need to continually... On a routine, regular basis, have this Word of God in front of my eyes. Notice what he said in verse 21, let them not depart from your eyes. What happens if I do let them depart? Well, the rest of the verse tells us about what can happen if you do. He goes on to tell us. So we know that my ears need to hear the Word. The Word needs to be on a regular basis in front of my eyes. Now notice, keep them in the midst of thy heart. How am I going to keep the Word of God in my heart? I have to hear it, and I've got to see it. Everybody say it. i got to hear it, and i got to see it. Say it again. I have to hear it, and I have to see it. 
What will it do? It will help me to keep the Word of God in me. What's the benefits of keeping the Word of God in me? When a situation comes around that's contrary to the Word, the Holy Ghost will remind me of what I've heard, and it's in here, and He's going to remind me, and now I can pull it out and speak it out of my mouth. Come on, church. And now I can use that Word to bring peace and comfort to me and to those around about me, and I can stand on the Word of God rather than on the circumstance and situation. Remember, the Word of God is like a rock. The world is sinking sand. When I'm standing on the Word of God, I am on the most secure ground you and I will ever be established on. When I'm off of it, I'm out here in sinking sand. What's sinking sand? Quicksand. What's that mean? What does quicksand do? It starts to pull you down. Anybody remember the old black and white cowboy movies? How about the old Tarzan movies back in the 1930s? Remember Tarzan getting into quicksand, Jerry? He'd get into the quicksand, or some of the other people do. It started to pull him down. Donnie's going, man, we're going back a few years, I know. That's back when TVs were still black and white. Some of you have to get up on YouTube and pull that up. But it did actually happen. Glory to God. Everybody say, I need to hear the word. And I need to see the Word to keep the Word in my heart. Stand up, if you would, please. Glory to God.